Green, in cooperation with the Meadville Area Ministerial Association, now presents Faith in Life. Your host for today's program is the Reverend Dennis Coons of the Sunnyside Mennonite Church. And now, Reverend Coons. Greetings. With me today is Father Max Carg from St. Bridget's Roman Catholic Church here in Meadville. And if you've been following us on our other programs, we have been going through the Apostles' Creed and talking about the great confessions of the Christian faith. Today we want to pick up on that part of the Creed which talks about Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. And Father Karg, maybe a good way to kick this off is simply to talk a little bit about the idea of the historical Jesus. And uh, you've been to the Holy Land, and maybe you can talk about some of the impressions you picked up as you traveled there and talked and witnessed the places of the, where Jesus lived. Mm -hmm. Well, as you know, Dennis, there's been a lot of uh, controversy in the 20th century on whether Jesus really was an historical person to start with, you know, or whether he was just made up by the early Christian church, or whether he was a you know, some type of Essene monk from the, you know, John Qumran the Baptist, monasteries, yeah, yeah. from the Qumran monasteries. So when I went in 1972 uh, to the Holy Land, um, I went with a lot of um, questions in my mind. Uh, now, what am I going to find in the Holy Land? And um, so we went with a, uh, the Near East Association, which uh, I went with 45 priests and a bishop. Hmm. And of course we met uh, thousands and thousands of pilgrims there and we went to the Holy Land we stayed in Jerusalem a week and we went up north to Galilee and uh, we did see uh, uh, you know the major signs of, of Jesus uh, life and uh, so I was saying to myself well the guide was saying well now um, fathers uh, here is where the Lord did this and I'm saying well now how do you know that you know and he would say, uh, now f we went to Bethlehem and they took us in the beautiful church of Bethlehem downstairs underneath. And uh, he said, now this is where Jesus was born. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, you know, uh, how do you know that? You know, I mean, is that, is that really an historical fact? That, you know, there was a person, Jesus, born there or not? So I had, I had a lot of doubts in my mind. And they were all resolved one morning. Uh, we were in the Sea of Galilee up north in, in uh, Nazareth and uh, one morning our guide who was a Muslim by the way he was an Arab he was a Muslim yeah he, he was a Muslim and uh, so he took all of us out on the on a boat one morning on the Sea of Galilee and it's it's just gorgeous uh, the sea you know it's a uh, twice the size of Connaught Lake and it has uh, big mountains and they roll down into the into the uh, little diamond you know as a well it's more like a an egg you might say and uh, we went out on the boat it was about eight o'clock in the morning and uh, he said uh, now up here is where Herod had his palace it's where he built his palace up there and he says you can find the foundations uh, still mm -hmm. remains it was over there he pointed that uh, uh, Jesus fed the 5,000. It was over there that the, the pigs uh, ran into uh, it was into the sea when Jesus, mm -hmm. uh, you know, cast the demons, cast into, the the demons the into the hogs. And then he was over here where he, he cured the um, uh, uh, leper or something, you mm -hmm. know, uh, the, and there's hot springs there. And he said, you know, at our Lord's time, there was 100,000 people lived around this lake. And he says, today there's only 20,000. One little city, the city of Tiberias up there. While we were sitting in the middle of the Lake of Galilee, being lectured to by a Muslim who, <laughs> you know, who did not believe in him, in the Christian faith, and suddenly it, it just hit me like a hammer. I am listening to a living oral tradition. This man is repeating what he learned from a guide, mm -hmm. who's repeating what he learned from a guide, who's repeating what he learned from a guide all the way back through the centuries. And we have to realize that the Jewish people have been coming to the Holy Land of the Jews of the Diaspora since uh, five centuries before, uh, five mm -hmm. centuries before Christ was born. And certainly there hasn't been a day that has passed in history that there haven't been people in the Holy Land looking at the places where Jesus lived and worked and worked his miracles. and 
here we are, 2,000 years in the, in, the, in, the, in the history of man is really not a long time. It's not a long time. The, the rivers and streams are exactly where they were in Jesus' time. The roads are exactly where they were in Jesus' time. And when that Muslim says up there was Herod's palace, that's where Herod's palace was. And that Jesus did that here, no doubt in my mind. That this is an historical person who really is and says what the New Testament says that he is. I was profoundly, profoundly moved and touched. <laughs> it seems that uh, some of the controversy grows up because we do not have a wealth of written evidence outside extra biblical that is uh, I believe uh, Josephus makes a passing reference to Jesus and I read in Time magazine last year uh, there were some questions to whether that section was authentic to Josephus's mm -hmm. writings uh, and that was only a paragraph uh, or two I believe in his antiquities where of course he wasn't writing about the Christian church no he wasn't he was writing a Jewish for the Jews, sure. right? and um, then I believe uh, there is some evidence, I understand, among some Roman writings yes. um, of, uh, of the Jesus, a person named Jesus did live, that he was crucified. Right. Uh, Pliny the Younger, for example, wrote does a he, letter. He does say that. Yes, he was governor and he wrote uh, to Rome for guidance on how to handle the Christians because he had heard a lot of complaint against them. So we have his letter. Uh, Suetonius, the uh, uh, Roman historian, also mentioned Jesus. Uh, but how do you account for this vast Christian church. You Precisely. See. Without at least attesting to an historical being right. who, did, right. who did exist. Uh, I was wondering how, you perhaps have more background in some of the uh, scholarly works than I do, but how, um, how do they deal with the ev evidence of Pliny's letter and so forth if, if somebody wishes to deny the historical? Well, if you want to deny Pliny's letter as being, uh, you know, historically accurate, then uh, you know, we, we base it on the same evidence that we would base that there's a Julius Caesar, that there's a Cleopatra, that right. there's anything of history, you know. If, if you say, well, we'll accept this document, but we won't accept that document, well, then you say, well, what, you know, what is true? You know, we have to use the tools of history as given to us. Yeah. And certainly, we're dealing with, uh, you know, reliable historical evidence here. We're not dealing with hearsay and, uh, you know, mm -hmm. we're dealing with reliable historical evidence. When you come to the, uh, ultimately, you are backed up to the scriptures as, oh, your, yes. as your final evidence of who Christ was, Absolutely. what he did, and what he said. Right. Uh, I was talking one time uh, with a friend of mine who mentioned that, um, well, we don't really know accurately what Jesus said. I said, well, given, you may not want to say you have a verbatim right. in the Bible, but you have to at least believe at the least, that the essence and meaning of everything Jesus taught and meant is there, or else we have nothing. Well, the New Testament, as we know, is the, you know, the faith and the belief of the early oh, Christians. Sure. Right. They wrote the New Testament, right. and they are recalling and seeing the, the, you know, the life of Jesus in its total dimension. Right. You know, and uh, his, uh, uh, not just when he was among them, but at, you know, 30 or 40 years later, the full reflection of who he was. Mm -hmm. So when they wrote the New Testament, it is the faith of the living church based on the experience of being with this man, mm -hmm. man God, whom they now see in his full dimension as Christos, as Lord, mm -hmm. as God, you see. So they write from that perspective. And that brings up a question, and you mentioned uh, the word Christos, and um, Paul connects very often Christ with the name Jesus. Mm -hmm. And that raises the question as to what that means. Maybe we could bat that around a little bit. What does the term Christ mean? Well, uh, essentially it means, uh, you know, the one who is to come, mm -hmm. you know, the Messiah. Mm -hmm. That Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the one who okay. is to come. And Messiah meant for the Hebrews, anointed one. The anointed one, the promised the one, one of history, right. And the one whom the blessing of God is upon. Right. So then by connecting the name of Jesus with Christ, Paul affirms that in Jesus of Nazareth is the anointed one of God, the one who was to come, who was promised to be the Messiah of the Jews and the Savior of all mankind. Right. Okay. Perhaps we could also pick up another concept which you find in the early church that Paul often said, Lord Jesus Christ, or Jesus Christ our Lord. Right. And we might want to pick that up a little bit and talk about the term Lord. Well, of course, this is the great uh, 
the great revelation is that nowhere in the Old Testament is it clearly said that the Messiah would be God. You know, the Messiah right. is the anointed one. Um, he's the, the chosen one. Uh, he is to bring Israel into a new kingdom. But there is not, you cannot prove from the Old Testament that the Messiah would be God in human form. And that was the great surprise of, of New Testament times, is that, you know, Jesus, Jesus uh, would be, is, be divine. Is, is a divine person. And, the, you know, this was unthinkable in Jewish history. Uh, they, they weren't even allowed to carve statues, of course, you know, uh, in, 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 in the right. images of God. You know, the, the image of God had to be, um, you know, totally transcendent, uh, unique and singular and one. And then to say that God to become a man, it's almost heresy in the Jewish mind, mentality, you know, because that's what the pagans did, of course. Uh, you know, the Jews, uh, not the, the Jews, but the Greeks had how many gods in human form? You know, thousands of them. And, uh, of course, the Egyptians believed that their pharaohs were divine. Sons of God, I believe. Yes. And so it's, it's really, uh, uh, you know, antipathal to the Jewish mind to, to believe that, that, that God could become a man. And this is the great surprise, of course, that God played on us. Well, it's interesting then that when you come to the Old Testament and you look into the, uh, the post-the the period after the exile, mm -hmm. The name of God was so holy that they would not pronounce it, so they would use the Hebrew term Adonai. Adonai, right. Uh, which means Lord in, in right. our English language. And only and, once a year could you only. use uh, the name God, you know, on the oh, Feast of the, the Atonement. Oh, I see. And the high okay. priest would go into the temple, the Holy of Holies, you know, and open up the curtains once a year and go into the Holy of Holies okay. and he would say the sacred word of God, Yahweh. Uh -huh. never allowed to be spoken by the normal Jew. Well, maybe we can pick up on that on the next program and take that further and talk about what it means to confess Jesus as the Son of God. So, uh, Max, would you um, close in just a word of prayer? To believe in God is a grace from God, and to believe in His Son is the grace beyond all graces. For we believe that God in his mercy and his love sent to us himself in human form, his only son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who would be the great revelation of the Father, who would lead us to a new and profound understanding of what it would mean to be children of God, who would lead us to his Father. May this holy word, Logos, that we call Son, come to our lives and give us his grace. Amen.